Hello, hello. Welcome back. Welcome back to another 343 TV stream. With your boy Icarus Moth. We're doing another genre breakdown. I've seen some familiar faces in the chat. We've got Silent Day with us. What's up, Michael Black? <clears throat> Hope we're doing all all doing well today. Uh, I'm, I'm actually in a new place now. We just moved. So I'm a, a little exhausted, but we're gonna we're gonna hang in there. We're gonna do some fun stuff today. Um, we're focused on breaking down an old piece of music I made um, with some students a while ago, so that should be really fun. Let me uh, swap us over to that real quick here, um, so I don't waste too much time. I want you guys to hear what we're working on. Um, and so, yeah, like I said, I'm in a new spot. Hopefully, moving forward, I can incorporate some cool uh, stream-related content that I can do with my better space. I also have way better internet, so hopefully, it's also better on your guys' end moving forward here too. Um, so, yeah, good to see you all again. I've got chat here, so if you have any questions or want to shout at me or if something goes wrong, please, please don't hesitate to let me know. Uh, but otherwise, we're going to pretty much just jump in here. So today's genre is going to be garage, and that's, again, just like everything else, it's kind of like a big term. Uh, there's a lot of different styles of garage music out there. It's kind of like a, it's a blanket genre that can be applied to a variety of other styles of music, too. And I'm telling you right now, I'm not really um, the last word on garage music certainly um, if you go to my spotify page i don't have any <laughs> but i listen to it um, and i like it right and you know we we do things in our free time that sometimes don't ever see the light of day um, but you know still enjoy and this one's kind of cool because uh, a lot of this was done with uh, sound design so all the the drums are made with operator kind of like last time a lot of these sounds are or pulled out of a voice so let me play this for you and then we're going to break it down talk about it a little bit I can show you guys some plugins i like to use we can chat we can just chat make sure the audio is good
All right, so there we have it. So yeah, I see you guys discussing the genre in the chat. A future garage, I like that. That makes sense. Kind of fits my style, but I'm I'm piano based producer, so always something very piano centric, piano related is gonna wind its way up into the the production, right? So that's that's me. Who who is garage? Um, so I had a question. Am I gonna be going through this track breakdown different than usual? Um, I don't I don't know if I've done enough streams to establish a usual. Um, but yeah, I think kind of like when I was breaking down the acoustic. Uh, electronic blends that's going to be kind of similar to what we're, what we're looking at here i'm not really necessarily going to change too much about the track maybe if i catch um something that i did that i don't agree with anymore and we'll we'll talk about it and change it um, but for the most part it's uh what decisions did i make why did i make them and then how did i create these sounds because none of this is you know preset stuff uh, except for maybe one of the uh, acoustic instruments that i modeled later on with something like contact um i see you guys talking about the track i like it thank you appreciate it See, if I missed any questions, feel free to put them back in the chat. I don't know. Looks like uh, we got Thomas reminded me about the uh, the giveaway this week is a pro session of your choice with a 343 um, instructor. So it's pretty valuable. It's pretty valuable. I'd, I'd definitely sign up for that one. All right, cool. So let's let's just jump in here a little bit. Um, yeah, sorry about earlier, too. I don't know. My OBS quick commands aren't working these days. There's always something wrong, huh? And... All right, so let's look at some of the sound design here. So I'm gonna play some of these drums back and you know, we're gonna talk about the genre a little bit. So if we kind of grab, you know, a little part of my drums that's got everything going on. It's, you know, pretty standard choice of instruments. We got a kick drum, a hi-hat and a snare drum with some, you know, maybe alternate snare drums as, um, you know, percussion choices. But we can see these three sounds are coming from three different operators here. And last time, uh, I think it was last stream, we, we went through and we designed some drums and operators. So I'm not gonna necessarily, you know, spend a bunch of time in here talking about how I created these sounds because we could just, you know, pull up the last stream and kind of remind ourselves. But um, some of the stylistic choices are ma I made are to be very kind of dark, right? Garage music is oftentimes uh, not so, like super bright, which I think even mine still wound up being kind of bright, which is why the word future slipped in there. Um, but we have like really kind of like dark, um, you know, not, not super high frequency kind of reverberate wrists you know they sound like they're coming from like a tunnel or, or a dark warehouse something like that um, and so you'll see me cutting out a lot of high frequencies or you'll see me focusing on a lot of mid frequencies instead so our first sound is our kick drum here so on this track you can see I've got two different MIDI notes going so our main kick drum up here is really kind of you know the, the main hit but then we have these kind of offbeat uh, percussion low frequency things that just help add a little bit of bump to the bass line when they catch. Um, and then if we look at the actual synth itself, um, what we're really just doing is taking sine waves and making them go from a high frequency to a low frequency very quickly, right? Um, so we've got sine wave here, sine wave here, sine wave here, sine wave here. Well, noise, we got a noise for the click. I don't think I've gone in and changed any of the harmonics. Nope, so these are all just pure sine waves that we've messed with a little bit. We have a little bit of a pitch envelope going on here. Um, doesn't really look like I'm using too much else of this synth. It's just a you know a little bit of FM process. And so if we were to take off some of the processing on this track, we'll notice the kick drum. Well, let's grab this stuff as well. Bear in mind, I also have audio effects on the master channel, so that's going to contribute too. But well, there we go. So that's the little kick drum that we kind of created with operator. The reverb on the group really helps put it in a space, especially for something like garage music. Um, and then the post-processing on the track itself, a little bit of EQ to give it more high end and shelf off some of the lower frequencies. I think I was just using my ears um, to find where this roll off point just helped the sub resonate with the uh, kick drum. And saturator to you know drive our frequencies here, add a little bit more to the kick drum, which balance with our output and then our dynamics just to kind of help uh, deal with the actual you know shape of our final kick drum there so all of that helps add a little bit of oomph to kind of like the small subby sound we created with the kick drum here um, and contact context adds the rest of it right it ends up working out for us so the snare drum is very similar story if we look at our uh, operator here we have some noise going on we also have some sine waves going on with no adjustments to the harmonics um, I did change my routing here so we do have the white noise split from our uh, uh, sine waves um, and so if I were to like turn our white noise bit off it's just the little punch of the snare right and then this white noise bit is kind of the actual snare bit of the snare the snares underneath so together they kind of help create that concept of hitting a snare drum if we look at this on an EQ it's a little bit thinned out you know not a lot going on in the mids that's okay it's electronic genre we can kind of get away with that but look what I'm doing to the high end um, if I were to take this away 
it's like very bright you know this would not make this snare drum feel necessarily like it was in the genre that we were working in here and so i i considered this you know in post so if i turn off all these audio effects here you know this is the snare we designed in operator it's honestly more like on the future base like skrillex side of things right it's very bright very punchy very splashy um, and then we kind of tweaked it from there. So instead of uh, thinking of the sound that I wanted and then trying to make it entirely with um, Operator, I was considering what I could do with audio effects afterwards. I think a lot of people get wrapped up in one or the other, like, oh, I need to complete my entire synth just with the parameters within the synthesizer. Well, sometimes that's not necessarily gonna be enough. And sure, you might be able to even accomplish it, but that might just be more effort than it's worth than you know slapping some audio effects afterwards. And similar to, what you might remember from my operator stream, it's just EQ saturator and compressor a lot of the time. Um, so you can see cutting out a lot of the high end, add a little bit of a resonance here on that cutoff, which is just a frequency I liked in the, the kind of like upper mids, low high frequencies. Saturate for texture, right? Cause helps our punch a lot. We were missing the mids and then look, I'm cutting out the sub and I'm dipping the high end even further. That was kind of reintroduced with our saturator. Um, and then a similar glue compressor to the kick drum, in fact, it's almost the same, just with a different balance of stuff. Um, and that's that's our snare. So the, what I'm doing here with the MIDI is allowing different frequencies of the snare drum to act as you know different samples, right? This to me feels a little bit more like a tom than up here where we have like our snare drum, right? So this one sound I can get a little bit more out of when it's a synth because I can you know try it out on a variety of different uh, frequencies here. Now, one thing you could do with one of these operators is use this fixed feature, which we talked about in uh, the, the operator stream. And that's going to cause certain frequencies to stay the same no matter what note you play while others can change, which means that different notes are going to resonate completely differently because you'll get that weird phasing going on. And sometimes that can create really cool effects. So you can kind of try that out. <clears throat> okay, cool. So that's our snare drum here. Um, we'll go down to our hi-hat here and similarly, got a lot of white noise we got a sine wave here allowing us to create a little click but it's just the very short beginning bit of that hi-hat the rest of this is coming from um, our white noise here and you can see i have automation going on on our filter frequency here and this is a low pass or high pass filter so it's just allowing some of the lower frequencies to come through um, but because of how this works it's causing the like fundamental frequency of that hi-hat to sound like it's different each time it hits which kind of represents you know somebody actually playing a hi-hat or me using more than just one sample here so that once again paired with using different notes on the frequency grid we can kind of get you know a variety of different hi-hats in the track here so once again cutting out high high frequencies because i'm looking for this kind of darker tone uh, i didn't even get a saturator on this one i apparently didn't think that i needed it um, so that together all runs into a reverb, which is the standard Ableton reverb, our MyCLA drums multi-tool, which is paralleled right now. So there's a version of this that's not being processed. I'm still still not 100% sure about this move. I'm, we're, 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 <laughs> the, the verdict's still out on that one. We'll see. I'm using my ears. I like the sound of it for now. Um, so we have a low frequency EQ, a high frequency EQ, a little bit of a parallel compressor, a bit of reverb, but this is a room reverb that's almost inaudible. And then a gate tool. So the gate tool is actually gonna cut out some of the like tail of my drums and also cut out some of the tail of this reverb we created, which is partly why I have this 50-50. I want that to still, still play, but this tool is focusing more on the initial impact of my drums than it is uh, the rest of them. And then we have some EQing going on for filter adjustments. This looks like it's only being used at the very end to kind of end the song here. And then we got this one, which is a high pass filter that's sweeping the the whole drum sample up which with what looks like a pretty sharp resonance which means we're going to hear that sort of whoop effect um, from the eq so there you go that's all in all my drums we have this strange sound which i think is a resample of a frozen reverb on a snare let's see or a hi-hat so the way that that was achieved because you can't it's frozen so you can't see it anymore is i took a low pass filter with a high resonance and just kind of kind of wobbled it back and forth that gives you that kind of like old school you know, pew, tv turning off like a ctv turning off you know <clears throat> so i don't know it, it seemed to fit the vibe here it's just a simple white noise uh eq sweep so i i don't know why i ended up freezing that that seems unnecessary i guess maybe to warp it probably let's see 
yeah, I got warping going on here. Although I'm in the wrong mode for something like this sound for sure. So I'll just switch that to complex while we're here. Um, cool, so those are my drums. I'm gonna play a bit of the drums back for you by themselves. So like we can really hear that reverb and that's a stylistic choice, you know, on the side of this being meant to sound like garage music. We like these big kind of dark spaces for, for that kind of that kind of song. So cool. Let's let's take a look at some of the instruments here, because this is where um, I think we spent a little bit more time um, on this track than in my operator stream. We were really just focused on drums. And so we have our bass here. And what you might notice about this is it's kind of wobbly. It kind of moves around. The correct term for that is it kind of phases a little bit. Oops. Um, and the reason for that is because of some pitch discrepancies between the voices within the synth, right? <laughs> Michael's the only one in chat. Come on, guys. Michael's feeling a little lonely. Let's join him. Um, so what we have here in this operator synth, which I can tell you right now is pretty simple. Let me get rid of this stuff on the track for now. There we go. This is what's going on on our operator synth. So if I turn the filter off on the operator synth, it's just two sawtooth waves on top of each other. So I had to change the routing and operator. I'm barely, I'm not even using the FM part of this FM synth, uh, but that's okay. And so you can see we're running these in parallel and one of these saw waves, which are just set to the, the basic saw wave here, are is detuned up 18 cents, which is going to cause this saw wave and the same saw wave beneath it um, to phase, right? That's going to soften the synth a little bit. It's going to cause certain frequencies to kind of phase in and out. Um, and it's going to cause this interesting movement to happen in the bass. Now, that creates this nice sort of like phased out Hoover effect for the low end, um, which is really popular in like hip hop music these days and especially electronic music uh, genres as well. Um, but it can cause some problems with our sub, right? And so if we are phasing out the low end and we have strange, you know, uh, panning or pitch variation going on in the sub frequencies and we go and perform our music at a venue that converts our signal back to mono before it you know plays it out into the room we might find that our sub frequencies just go away entirely they end up being phased out completely and that's a problem right because it might sound great in your headphones where the left and the right signal don't ever interact with each other in a space um, but when you switch over to that environment you're going to have a bad time so we need to do some things to make sure that we're accounting for that one thing is to just check it in mono and if it sounds good, you're good. <laughs> um, but we have some tools in Ableton that will work too. So I know that I might be having these problems, especially because I'm using the spread knob in this operator, right? So the spread knob causes differences in the left and the right speaker on the sound. And those are really where you'll run into some, some phasing problems in the low frequencies. This pitch thing usually will just cause like a wobble. Um, and you'll you'll notice that happening if you would play like two low notes together at the same time that are right next to each other on the piano, instead of like, hearing two tones it's usually just one frequency that feels like it's on an lfo like or like a volume lfo right so we're trying to achieve that in the frequencies that are appropriate for it which are like the low high low frequencies and the low mids and the mids um while leaving the sub nice and clean so we're just going to run this through a saturator first to to help out our frequencies here uh we do have a filter on our uh, synth from the operator, which is moving a little bit, but it's a really long like attack decay here, which means it's not necessarily going to complete the envelope for each note. Um, and over here we have our utility tool, and this is really what's doing, I think, the most here. I think I can zoom in on OBS. I keep forgetting I can do this. So on this tool, we have our base mono button, which I think is really the only thing I'm using, and that forces certain frequencies under um, a specific, you know, point that you choose here to stay mono. And so I've chosen 105 hertz. I was just using my ears for this one. And so that's really going to kind of save me here. It's gonna let everything above 105 hertz maintain the crazy stuff that it gets from being detuned and from being spread with our operator, but the rest of it um, will end up being okay. So I have our low pass filter here for different parts of the song. So we can have like a little bit more upper frequencies going on, or we really pull it down to just the like, lowest couple of harmonics you can see there's an lfo on our filter as well here you can see because i'm sending it to the filter frequency and i've deactivated our pitch adjustment on the lfo i think that's what gets a lot of people um on with operator when they're trying to use the lfo so if i grab a brand new operator here we'll take a look at this <clears throat> Let's say that I wanted to set up an LFO to our operator tool here. 
Whoa, I'm so sorry. And I were to turn this on, increase the amount right away, it's affecting the pitch, right? And it's not necessarily obvious why, it's because it's the destination here is set. <laughs> uh, so we have this going to A, B, C, and D automatically. If we just turn these off, now our LFO is not talking to anything and we can send it to something via our destination B. It's kind of a weird default for Ableton to set, but if you wanted to, you could always just open up a blank operator, go into your LFO, deactivate A, B, C, and D, and then right click at the top and save it as the default preset so that it never shows up like that again. And if you want it to affect the pitch, you have to go in and turn it on yourself, right? Um, there's a few things in Ableton that are kind of like that. I'm not really sure why they did that. It's okay. Is this garage? Yeah, so Martin, you said you you were a little bit late. This is a, this is a track I made a little while ago, uh, meant to kind of mimic burial style garage, but with some more modern sounds. So the chat was calling it future garage, which I agree with for sure. Um, so I'll play the track in full back for you here momentarily as we get to kind of like the midway point of our stream. Um, but yes, that's, that's what we're focused on. It's really like a sound design thing. I'm kind of breaking down how I created these sounds. We're also talking about composition, but we're not quite there yet. Um, can never choose your watch list. Yes. Okay. Cool. Got everybody. All right. Nice. So yeah, that's our, that's our base, right? So we are able to kind of control this here. I also have a compressor so that it's just a little bit more consistent. Cause again, that uh, phaser is going to cause like the volume to change over time. And so I'm just squashing it a little bit with our compressor here. And so all in all, that gives us this really sort of nice buzzy, but not too bright in the way and definitely nice and full in the low end, especially once that LFO comes in because we can hear those harmonics being kind of played with here. And again, I'm only allowing a few to come through, but I do let these frequencies go pretty low. There's also some pitch bending going on here. Uh, which probably means that, yep, I have one voice activated here and we have our glide mode uh, set to like 389 milliseconds. That's actually a pretty long glide here. Um, so there you go, that's our sub. Um, I think later on I do jump up to different notes. There you go, you can really hear that glide. Some of these I don't let it glide, right? There's no overlap here. So instead of gliding to this note, it jumps to it, which creates a much different sort of feeling. Right, so that's pretty cool. So that's our base, and that's kind of meant to give our pad synth under here more body, right? So if I play our bass and our pad together, over here with the LFO. Here they play quite nicely together. So what's going on with this pad synth is actually not all too different from what was going on with my bass. Um, I am using adjusted sine waves here a little bit. So if we look at oscillator A's uh, harmonic spectrum, or I guess this is the partial grid. I gotta, I gotta just call it the partial grid. I hate that term because it just doesn't make any sense. But um, yeah, anyway. So I painted these in. I just I don't know, I went up and down on some of the harmonics here until I really liked the balance, and that's kind of like our main uh, generator of sound, right? The rest of this stuff is all processing in sequence. So I kind of have some interesting things going on where this is just a basic sine wave processing a sine wave with some upper harmonics, which the result of is then processing this one with only a little bit of the third harmonic. Um, I, I just you use your ears, right? These middle heart, like the harmonics at the bottom, the, the first like five or so, which is just, you know, octave, fifth, fourth, major third with a little bit like it's a little flat of a major third kind of in between major and minor third. Um, those are kind of like your money ones when it comes to creating like a thick sound in the lower and mid frequencies. The stuff up here gets really thinned out, right? Because as we travel up the harmonic series, it gets tighter and tighter and tighter uh, as far as the intervals being made to the point where it becomes less than a note. Um, so yeah, we have a little bit of processing going on here and at, over time it kind of fades in. I bet these envelopes have some attack going on. You can see I'm not even letting this get to the full level I've set here. So it's at negative 23 dB, but this only goes about halfway up. So it's not even going to get all the way there. Um, a lot of these just have this kind of like nice attack to help this move around on its own a little bit. Um, it doesn't look like I have any sort of pitch differences differences going on here. And so the, the wobbliness, the phasing that's going on in our baseline that's happening in this pad synth too is coming from spread. I've maxed this out to a hundred percent spread. Um, it also looks like we have our pitch envelope going, which means that every time I play a note, 
ooh, ooh, it kind of bends up from a lower pitch too, right? So the reason why I do stuff like this, other than the fact that it just like it sounds nice, right, is uh, instrument articulation, right? Think about a variety of different instruments that exist in the world, right? Like a piano, like we play it with, I don't know if you guys can hear this, I don't think it's actually routed, but um, you know, it's a hammer, it strikes a string, so it's very sort of percussive, but tonal at the same time. Um, we have things like guitars. And so think about like how a bass is played, right? You can kind of like, you know, finger a bass like this, you can slap a bass like this, but so oftentimes you're gonna slide up to a note or slide down away from a note, things like that. And so uh, this pitch adjustment um, kind of mimics, you know, the articulation of a variety of different instruments that you can kind of tweak the pitch of as you play, right? We don't necessarily have as much power to pitch bend a piano as we play it, unless we're doing crazy stuff with the strings in the back. Um, Martin says a lot of older sub bass tones were generated with the sine wave test signal from the Akai samplers. Yeah, so I mean those old samplers really helped shape and mold the sounds that we use and are inspired by today that we use, you know, things like Serum 4 now, which is you know, obviously a crazy digital synth that um, has a lot you can do with it or something like Omnisphere, which has almost everything built into it. Um, but yeah, they all kind of came from from those old samplers for sure. So it's 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 a cool history lesson. I'm not really the one to to do it, but maybe we'll on a stream here kind of break down some of the really old uh, like circuit style things and talk about you know why it sets them apart from something like a digital operator. Um, cool. So we also have our filter going here. Mm. Never mind, no, we don't. Filter is just kind of cutting this at 12, not really doing anything else with that. Um, but we do have our LFO going here, and it looks like this is for the pitch. So I did actually want to use my LFO to create a little vibrato in the signal, right? Vibrato is right? So we're going to have pitch wobble going on here. But because of how strong this is, you see my amount's at like 8.7%. So we got to like really pull that back to get it to work. Uh, looks like I have my low frequencies being automated so that in the beginning, this is a big full synth. But in my, I guess what we'll call build, it thins it out, right? So I'm cutting out the fundamental frequencies of my pad so that only those upper harmonics are allowed to play through, which does a few things. It puts it further away, makes it feel like, you know, maybe we're, you know, hearing this through like a filter, like we're behind a wall or something like this, but it's the higher frequencies. So it doesn't really close it off. It more, you know, scoops it out. So that's going to help just kind of make room for new things, right? Um, this is where we have a melody come in or we have a little vocal chop come in that's playing a bit of a melody. And so I really want your attention to go from the pad and the bass here over to the new sound, right? Which is why I'm pulling away from some of my instruments here. In fact, both. This is where the sub starts doing its LFO and this is where the pad um, gets its filter. It does end up coming back because again, we do want to kind of progress upward throughout this piece of music. Uh, Garage is still pretty progressive, um, but that's, that's the decision that's that's my decision making process there um, so chords wise um, the beginning is not got anything all that really crazy going on I've just got some nice inverted chords here uh, that make things easier right so we have B minor F sharp minor and then G minor I don't know I can't I can't read my brain no and then E minor um, and I've just inverted them, right? So that they are kind of close to home. This is kind of like playing it like you would on a piano, right? There's there's different fingerings for different chord progressions on the piano that make it either easier or harder to play. And sometimes those big jumps sound cool and sometimes keeping it nice and close to home uh, feels good, which is why I have this um, here. And in fact, this downward trajectory that my chord progression has, like each chord has a note lower than the, the one previous, um, cause to me feels like I'm like drawing people in right coming down like a trajectory on a chord progression to me feels like it's doing this versus like expanding like we're about to go somewhere so maybe later on you'll see me change that a little bit um, but that's how we start this off once we get a little bit later on looks like we got the same thing going on just with some like octave back and forth stuff but now look at this later on I do have the trajectory of this chord progression change by adding some more notes to these things so I think yeah this is the same chord progression but now this is a seven chord instead of just a regular minor chord I'm not gonna try and name that right now <laughs> uh, this is like a six chord down here with a melody note up here and the same thing with another melody note so this causes this trajectory to go up which really feels like we're going somewhere new right so when I play this back listen to how the beginning makes it feel like we're, I'm drawing you in I'm like kind of bring you home and then once we get to this point it's more like the opposite it's like we're walking out the door going on an adventure so I'll play a little bit of this all
right, so I don't know if you guys have that same sort of reaction from that type of composition, but to me, that's how that type of trajectory causes that chord progression to feel. I can make that chord progression feel a variety of different ways by doing things like that. Um, so I think that's a cool trick, cool feature of composition. Um, and that's pretty much what's going on here. So there's one thing about the composition I did kind of forget to mention, which is really important to this genre. Now, not all pieces of garage music do this, but it is uh, kind of an iconic rhythm aspect. And if we listen to the drums, listen to that second snare, right? If I turn our metronome on, right? Usually in like house music and things like that, our snare goes on the two and the four. So that'd be two and four. Well, look, our second snare is a 16th note early, which creates an implied impact, right? When I play this drum beat back to you without the metronome, we still feel the downbeat here. Like we're still definitely on that metronome. That snare doesn't make us feel weird about that downbeat. It just kind of creates a little bit of not swing because it's perfectly syncopated, but because it feels a little off and it's out of where we're used to it being, it kind of does create a little bit of that sort of swung nature or syncopated nature. So that's uh, pretty common for um, uh, this type of rhythm. So is that uh, 16th note triplets on the drums? No, so that's what I was saying. It's not even swung at all. Like there's no triplets. It's just a regular 16th note early, right? Usually the snare is more like this, right? But instead, we have that shifted over. And because of that, and our brain's really feeling this downbeat here, even though there's no hit on this moment in time, we really feel it still. Like it still allows something to like land there in our brains, almost like like a ghost, right? Like kind of like a ghost note. Right? I don't even have a hi-hat on there. It's all just upbeat hi-hat stuff. So there you go. That that's important. I, I, that was honestly like of all the things in the drums that I was talking about. That's probably the most garage thing going on, <laughs> uh, in all of this all of this uh, rhythm stuff. So there you go. Didn't want to didn't want to forget that before we moved on. Um, so throughout the track, I just start kind of layering our sounds with more sounds, right? So this third instrument here is another operator instrument. Um, Oh yeah, so this is kind of interesting. We got some cool stuff going on here. So let me uh, let me break this apart. We'll do, turn off some audio effects here, and we'll oops, and we'll kind of get this from the the beginning here. So similarly, yeah, all this all this one has. So moving back to the pad synth from before, all this has is some filter motion going on with an EQ and a reverb. So this is that Valhalla reverb I like. Um, this is the thing that I was saying goes on sales sometimes, and then you guys reminded me that that is not the company that puts their stuff on sales. They do not do sales. Ooh, that was my stomach. Did you guys hear that? I hope not. Oh dear. All right, so let's come back to this synth. So it's following the same MIDI notes here. If I play this on its own, it's just a soft saw synth, right? That's not what this ended up sounding like in the end, but you can see how much we can do with audio effects and certain kind of creative things. So this is one single sawtooth. I'm not even using FM for the FM bit again. So here's operator kind of like not being used for what it's worth. Um, and I'm spreading it. So instead of creating extra voices with different oscillators and detuning them, I'm just basically getting that same effect from our spread knob here. And my tones knob is defaulted down and my frequency knob is defaulted down. So this is not like a full frequency saw wave. If I were to turn these up, it would end up being full frequency. Um, but I'm getting it, it's being filtered out anyway, so it doesn't matter as much. Um, but what's important about this is I'm not letting it play as a pad, right? We have this arpeggiator at the beginning, but look at the speed of this arpeggiator. It's set to 1 128th notes, which especially at 123 beats per minute is very, very fast. I also have our steps on one, which means it's going to go up to one octave before it re repeats the, uh, the arpeggio. And I have this on converge, which to be honest with you, at this speed doesn't really matter much, but this is what it ends up sounding like. And what's cool about this is even though I have my rate on 128th notes, which is so fast, we can't like, you know, we can't like assume that rhythm um, because of the fact that we have certain notes that stick out of these chords as the arpeggio is going, we hear a slower rhythm happening from the repetition of this arpeggiator, right? So we've almost like, we've kind of come full circle where turning the rate up so fast causes us to hear the beginning of the arpeggiator as the new rhythm, right? I'm hearing 16th notes. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And 
and then it's it slows down over here as we add more notes that would make sense right so we're using this to create rhythm within the sound we're not even really using this to to do the melodic stuff that you're used to doing with the uh, the arpeggiator um, and so from there, we're going through a lot of filters, right? So if I turn all our other stuff back on, we have an EQ that has a low cut, getting rid of some of the, uh, the body of the sound. We have a reverb that's on a hundred percent dry wet. <laughs> so I've immediately gone and taken this sound and said, Hey, I want you to be basically be a pad instead. I'm not really interested in, um, the actual sound of that arpeggiator, even though it was pretty cool. Um, I'm then auto panning this left and right, just a little bit, right? And I'm changing the rate over time. So this helps this synth become kind of a build, right? So you'll end up hearing that kind of increase, pick up the pace a bit. We have our side chain, which is the first time I've mentioned this, I think, but you know, side chaining is important. And then we have our filtering, which is really important for how this synth sounds because we need this to move some way since we've pretty much just covered it up entirely by going full reverb mode, right? So with our effects here, It's really pretty, right? It's much more interesting than that kind of plain soft synth uh, pad that we had from the original operator. And while I could probably get away with turning this Valhalla off and using it like this instead, again, think about the genre that I was going for here. Like those big buzzy bright sounds don't really happen in garage music very much. So that's what this drenched of drenched reverb is kind of meant to do is turn this into a more like lo-fi darker type of sound. Cool. So that leads us to this last layer before we get to our melodic sound. And this is the one thing other than that, that vocal that we didn't use operator for, right? So this is an acoustic sound. I'm using contact for this. Uh, this is the unicord, um, which is a, like a unique piano that only has one string per note. So if, as if you know, you know, certain different pianos have different setups for you know, grand, baby grand, et cetera, concert. But you know, the higher you go, the more strings you need to get them to reverberate if the same amount of power is the lower strings or at least close enough. And that usually helps them feel more balanced. Well, um, this one didn't worry about that and it used a couple of other methods to, to make this sound nice. And so you get this very sort of like. I don't know, like guitar -y. it's kind of like you, you really hear the sound of the note being played outside of just the tonality of it, right? A piano is very soft. The sound of the hammer striking the string doesn't necessarily come through the recording as much. Um, but for this sound, we definitely have... Like it's super, super felty. We can hear a click per note and it's also kind of a thin instrument. Kind of sounds a little bit more like a guitar to me like it's still definitely more of a piano but i get that kind of vibe uh cutting out the low frequencies just making room for stuff you know filtering is an important part of this uh, compressor which is heavy compression look at this threshold like look when i play a chord it goes all the way up to 10. so i'm squashing this because i want this to feel like a pad i don't really want this to feel like this percussive piano sound uh, and then I've got some like weird EQ shapes, like the eights on the bottom and sevens on the top. I don't know what's going on here. I got my scale set to negative 25. Like I'm a mess. I don't know what this is. <laughs> um, we're not gonna worry about it. I was using my ears for that one. Um, and so this is just meant to kind of cover the bridge, right? We have a unique melody show up here. Um, and this is the first time that it looks like I'm really kind of messing with the chord progression a little bit. And so we're gonna take a look at what I'm doing here to the chords. That's different. Oops, that's different. Uh oh. There we go. That's different than what we were before because it's not that different. And it's important to note that it's not that different. Um, but what really makes it different is the change of bass line, right? Same chord, same chord with, you know, the extra melodic notes that make it like a seventh or a ninth. And then here we have the same chord, but in the bass, we go all the way down to an E here. And then we come up to a C here for the same chord the next time around. And so this adjustment of the bass line here at the end really causes this to feel like a fourth chord instead of the same chord as the one before it. And this is a common practice in composition is just shifting a bass note to really get more out of a chord you have. Um, one thing to note is um, the fourth oftentimes works out quite well 
um, when you're doing this. So what we're looking at here is a, is that a G major six. It's a G major six. Um, and I have a C in the bass. C is the fourth of G. And so that's kind of like a, just a thing. So I think that works. So that's what I decided to go for here. The other reason why I really like this decision is because the first chord is our um, B minor here with a B in the bass, which means that the note before it, nah, nah, like it's just one half step down, right? So that's a really nice kind of lead back into the beginning of our chord progression that didn't happen before. Before this was just hanging out down on this E note. So it was dun, 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 and then it just repeated, right? So this really helps this pro, uh, this uh, progression, one, feel different, but also feel more perpetual, more cyclical, right? Like it kind of creates this nice circle. Um, and it's really just a small thing, like adjusting the bass note. So long-winded answer there, but that's what's going on here. So listen to the chord progression before it, and then this bridge part, and then the chord progression after it, and you can like really tell that that you know is pulling its weight, that one little change. So there you go. Um, it does look like halfway through the progression here, I'm letting this last chord really become. Oh, never mind. I just I just go for the full full the for the full nine chord here. I thought I was maybe letting this become a different chord, but I'm not. It's still the same G with the C in the bass. All right, cool. So there you go. There's there's our little bridge bit and the one sound in here, the one instrumental sound that didn't really come from resampling or uh, an operator um, and I think it just helps add a kind of like a cool texture to the sound everything else is very electronic in this and garage is kind of an organic genre just in general it feels a lot more organic than things like tech house and stuff right so I wanted to help you know push it closer to that sort of vibe with an organic instrument and so I've never used the unicorda thought it'd be a good time to try it out right um, so that really leads us to kind of like the lead instrument which I need to turn up so I should have done this all along but this needs to be a little bit more present and sit on top of the beat um, and what I started with was a recording of a voice saying back to me. Let's see if I can even find this. Let's see vocal. If I just search this into my sample pack, I should be able to pull open the original, hopefully. Oh, it's from Native Instruments. Okay, so it was number four. When you're next to me. So there you go. When you're next to me. I just took when next to me. Next to Next to me, next to me. I, I just heard that last little melodic bit from that voice, and I figured that would be kind of a good, um, you know, demonstration or you know, type of vocal that I could put into a, a garage track to kind of simulate what Burial was doing in, in Archangel with that vocal chop, right? So um, I, I took it and I warped it and I made it play a different rhythm and I pitched it so that it fit within the. The context of my song and then I added a bunch of processing to it to help make it feel like it didn't come from this you know original next to me. right if we play this back in context that doesn't quite sound like it used to right um, let me make sure none of this is frozen either so it looks like all the processing I did to this is right on here nothing's missing so we can take a look at it <clears throat> and first things first is a little alter boy so, you know, we gave away Crystallizer last week. I don't know if the, the lucky person who got that is here in the chat, but this is another Sound Toys tool. Um, and the Sound Toys stuff is great. You know, like I'm sure you've heard it from everybody, but um, this tool is really fun to use. It allows us to mess with the pitch and the formants of a recording completely separately. So I can turn the pitch up and the formants down, uh, which causes things to get a little crazy. So let me just one by one kind of turn our plugins on here, plugins and effects on. So you can hear the first Alter Boy is doing that big shift, right? So without it, oh, I already pitched the voice down. Hey, huh? did I, did I not? I guess I did. Interesting. It doesn't say frozen. 
Hmm, maybe I just bounced it out. Okay, well, I did pitch the voice down originally. I think I probably just used the Ableton, you know, warping to pitch this down, but it doesn't look like I'm seeing that, so I'm not 100% sure what's going on there, but that's okay. It must have when I created this loop here that got consolidated, so that's that's what's going on. So I really just used the warping pitch down to an octave, um, and then I immediately pitched it back up an octave with Alter Boy. Um, but I turned our formants down a little bit. So the combination of pitching it down in Ableton just via the warping and then pitching it back up with Alter Boy caused it to be a lot more resonant. So instead of texturous, like a voice is, like, like that stuff, it got kind of rid of that. And it's really just like this ring tone now. Listen to what happens when I mess with the formant slider. right so that's what the first little ultra boy is doing and then we run that into a group that is doing a couple of things i wish i could so that'll be more easily okay and we have this being split so it looks like it's another parallel thing so i have the original little alter boy just going through its own channel and then a second version of it being run into another alter boy that alter boy is pitching up a second octave and also shifting it down as well so this is doing that same sort of shift as the other one just maybe a little bit more on the formants here um, i am driving these a little bit but look our wet is 100 percent so i'm not allowing any of the original previous uh, signal to come through other than with my chain split here and so this version is running into a reverb so this is the, this is what this chain is. It's just a hundred percent reverbed version of this. Whoops, wrong thing. Right. So that's what we get uh, with a little extra reverb, and I'm blending that with the original. So that's that's kind of what's going on here. We have a couple of like octave layers. This is kind of like adding harmonies to the voice, right? A little bit. And then from here, I'm adding saturation. I don't know if I've ever used this tool in one of my streams, but it's probably like my favorite <laughs> of all time. I love it so much. Trash is amazing. Um, it's a multiband saturator if you're using the trash module, but we also have an EQ mod over here. We have a second EQ. We have a convolution filter, which is um, a variety of things. You can add like a physical space effect to this, or you can just use stereo separation to add some wideness to a track. We have dynamic effects here, which is also multiband ready um, and a delay, which is like a cool kind of like tape style, like filter delay. Um, so I, I love this tool to death. I think it's like a hundred bucks at Isotope and you know, Isotope does go on sale all the time. So that would be one to kind of look out for. It's part of their, a lot of their different bundles. So if you don't have it, I do recommend checking it out, but this is adding a lot of presence to everything. Um, so if I turn this off, let me play this moment in time. So without, and then with, oh, that's, that's our reverb. So there you go. Here's with the effect and then without. Right, the high end is way more present with this, and the mids are also a little bit resonant as well. But our mix is turned way down here, so it's not as not as much as the high frequencies. Uh, that's then running into a filter that I'm trying to cut out certain harsh frequencies from this voice. I just wasn't 100% sure. I think I was just using my ears. Like, oop, that was that was loud, so I pulled it back. And then we have some automation stuff going on. So this is a high pass filter and a low pass filter. We're automating the high pass filter or the low pass filter so that at the beginning of the song it starts way in the back and then kind of comes up to the front. So this is a tactic I use in a lot of different electronic genres when I'm producing. And it's this going from very wet to very dry effect. So by itself, listen to how the transition from this bit to the dry bit in the drop sounds. So that very wet to very dry is, a, is kind of a jarring effect. And when mimicked with all of my other instruments here, it can be really powerful. It's kind of like, you know, when you're sitting in a room and then all of a sudden the air conditioning goes off and you didn't even realize it was on and it's like dead silent and kind of strange. It's that similar sort of effect when we go from very wet reverberous sounds to a very clean dry version of them, especially with that, that uh, high frequency presence. Um, so that's then running into our sidechain. So that's pretty much everything that's going on here. Um, you can see I have my 
Valhalla verbs automated on and off for these moments in the uh, kind of, I guess I'll call it the chorus section uh, where I don't want that reverb going. But something happens a little bit later on where I turn this vocal into a synth instead. And I mean, look at this audio. It's a disaster, <laughs> but it's okay because it's being treated, right? Like, yes, I'm sending a wildly clipping signal into Little Alter Boy, but that's just pulling in distortion from Little Alter Boy and look at the output of Little Alter Boy. It's cut, so it's got its own little internal limiter effect here. So it's causing all of those distortion bits to just be applied via Alter Boy. And then I have some gain staging going on within the actual synth here. So that my output, well, it's still clipping. That's not great. We should probably go in and um, do something about that. But at this point, I was probably moving pretty quickly here. Um, and you can tell I was moving quickly because look at this automation we have. Like I have a bunch of points where that were added when I copied and pasted this little moment of time and messed with it. Um, and you can see what that's doing to our filter over here. It's kind of weird. Um, it, it's and it's fine. Like I don't know if that's hurting or adding to the sound at all, but that was definitely just dirtiness that was left in from what I was doing before. And so essentially how I created this is I took a moment of the voice probably like right there next to me where the note was like held pretty consistently i cut it i stretched it i messed with some of the uh pitch adjustments here and then each one of these is getting pitched a different direction to create a melody right so instead of putting this in a sampler and playing it on the piano i would like i said i was rushing so i just copied each one of these over and each one got its its own pitch and then i just duplicated it down the row once i had the looped once i had the uh, looped um uh, melody that i wanted to Oh, Martin says that this track sounds like it could benefit from some bit crushing. I absolutely agree with you there. So when you create room in the high frequencies by using like a lot of these filters and just creating dark sounds and stuff, that means that you have all that high frequency space to like add some cool sounds to. And a bit crusher is a really good one for, for kind of treating that space without it becoming like harsh and annoying. So yeah, I think Martin's suggestion of a bit crusher here would be really cool. So let's actually just throw a redux on here real quick. I don't have other bit crushers that I can use as quickly. So we're just going to stick with the redux tool. Um, and listen now this sound it gets a little bit more synth like I suppose as I reduce the rate of our redux here So we have like a dry wet here, so I could totally, you know, do one of these. It's probably something you'd want to automate on and off for different parts of the track, but let's hear what the melody sounds like with that big crusher. Pretty cool, right? It definitely fills that high frequency space uh, in a nice way. Um, I would probably just, you know, be a little bit more in particular about the way that I used that there and probably put it at a different part of my chain. Um, I think that uh, the bit crush on the reverb is giving me like a lot of pretty intense bit crushy noises and it's making it a little harder for me to control, but I do it kind of like that. So there you go. That gives me our melody synth. And I kind of put this on a new track and treated it a little differently. Like, in fact, I think I need to cut out some of this noisy low frequency from this moment as well. But again, that just kind of creates like dark garage vibes, having a little bit of ambience in the background there. Um, and on the note of ambience, I have a whole film static track that's going throughout the entire song that's being side chained heavily, heavily, heavily. So this pulses with our drums a lot, which I don't have going right now, but you'll see. There we go. So this gets ducked each time a kick or a snare hits by quite a bit and then takes a while to come back, but it helps create that ambience in the background. Like I said, we have all this room in the high frequencies. And so I let just a little bit of fuzz do this. So this is like, it's kind of like something you find in lo-fi music, but garage music is kind of lo-fi by nature. And so to me, this felt like a nice decision. Um, this is also directly inspired by Archangel. Like Archangel has this kind of strange noise pulsing with the drums as well. That really helps create a nice atmosphere there. Um, so, I mean, like, I guess I didn't even give the full backstory of this. This, this track was created with one of my in-person students at our uh, physical location in the city. Um, it was one of my Ableton One classes, actually. So it was a group of students and we were kind of talking about garage music that day and we were doing sound design stuff. And so this is what ended up coming out 
coming out of that, which is why you see some some rushed things and some weird stuff. But uh, Archangel by Burial was the reference for for this piece of music, so that's probably important to note, I guess, for people who are watching this video uh, not live. Um, but that's where a lot of my decisions were kind of sourced from, for sure. I think I've mentioned that at least once, and you guys have heard it. Um, so that's my choice for my ambient noise: is this film static? Um, let me see who does this film static, because. It's a really nice sample. This medicine, so that's the medicine splice pack, pretty sure. So you can find that on, on there if you want. And then that lastly leaves us with this, which is a bounce of this so that I can play it while the voice is going, right? I have these on the same track, and so I needed to bring this into another audio channel so I could play it along with uh, the dry vocal. So the synth is the voice, right? But because of how I treated it, when they play together, they still sound separate. <laughs> uh, what'd you think of the film symbol? <clears throat> so, yeah. And then we have these two little beep beep. I don't even remember making that. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows why those are there? But uh, a little bit of extra oomph to, to the very last section of the song here that then kind of fades out. So there you go. There's There was my thought process with our, our piece of garage music here. A little bit of sound design, a little bit of composition, a little bit of arrangement. Not really. I, like I mentioned, it's just very progressive piece of music here. So um, I'm going to play this back for you one more time. And then we'll have a little chat and I'll send you on your way.
So there you go. I appreciate your kind words, guys. I'm glad that you liked the track. I think this one was cool too. So I, it's part of the reason why I picked this one. There's definitely some tracks that I have saved here that were meant to be examples that I just don't think are really fun to listen to for an hour straight, so I won't pick them. Um, so how do you approach these kinds of projects with students generally? Do you do research on the track that is used as a reference or just go by feel? I just go by feel and we'll probably do that one day on one of these streams or I'll source a genre or a song from one of you guys in the, the chat and we'll just kind of break it down live. Um, to me, live music it is more fun. <laughs> um, and so not necessarily knowing what you know is gonna come out really leaves me in a position to also be a listener too, right? Not just the one kind of like driving the car, but also to be subjected to cool things too and really enjoy what comes out. Um, and so, yeah, I do usually pet by ear, but I definitely sourced burial from one of the students. You know, I asked, because there was maybe like eight people in the class and I asked one by one each day, you know, you send me a track that we're going to kind of break down today with whatever we're talking about. So if it was composition that day, we would look at the composition of a track. If it was sound design, we'd do the, compos do the sound design of another. Um, and so this was kind of like the the end of it all and so we were just kind of putting a whole track together with everything um, including like automation and everything with a little bit of mastering which is what you're looking at now is my my sad mastering chain which is not a real mastering chain at all but at least you can kind of take a look at what was going on there um and that this is what we, this is what we wound up with right so um this is um the result of that and it ended up being something i really enjoyed so that's why i kind of brought it back home and kept working on it just a little bit just to kind of put it in a position where i felt like it was you know enough of a piece to listen to and kind of talk about so that's how that's how this showed up i will make more of this stuff like i like this style of music for sure this kind of like you know softer like garage style stuff um with the with the sampled uh, or analog drums i think is really fun um so yeah you'll definitely be hearing more from them for more more from me there um but yeah don't forget that we do, um, you know, in-person classes in New York City and Berlin here at 343 Labs. So if you're ever trying to get connected with one of us uh, in the real world, you know, please head over to our uh, website, send us an email. Um, we'd be happy to hook you up with some stuff here. You know, our, our uh, giveaway right now is a pro session, which I got to believe, you know, is something that we'll do virtually if whoever gets it doesn't live in the city or in Berlin. Um, so, you know, maybe you'll have an opportunity to kind of get a one on one with one of us. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm understanding, understanding what pro session means. Um, or maybe it's, no, nah, 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 maybe it's one of our events, but, um, yeah, so look out for that stuff. If you were interested in, you know, having a class with myself or one of the other instructors, just reach out. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and like the video, do the YouTube things, please. We have to beg for it. Cause that's how YouTube works now. We can make a joke of it though. Um, so yeah, I don't know. That's, that's going to be it for me for the most part. Um, I'll hang out in the chat for a little bit, um, while we, while we kind of hang out here, but yeah, so it was good to, good to chill with you guys once again, as always, and I will catch you next time.